Welcome to the podcast. If you got a puppy recently and are wondering, now what? This episode is for you. I'm really excited. My guest today is Tanya Lim. She is a certified professional dog trainer and the co-founder of Family Pups located in Denver, Colorado. Welcome, Tanya. I'm so happy to have you here. Hi, Erica. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you about puppies today. Oh, puppies. We love <laughs> them, but it can be a challenge sometimes. I know you've gone through this with uh, in your in your personal with your personal dog, but also with all of our clients that we have to help. So I'm hoping that we will give those listening some value about what to do with your puppy. The holidays just passed. We're in the new year, thankfully, but I know a lot of people get puppies around the holidays. So hopefully we'll be able to help some of those people. Um, so uh, Tanya, let's just jump right into it. I, I know there's so, as a, as a puppy parent, I feel like a lot of people are, can be overwhelmed with what to train their puppy on, what to prioritize, where the hell do I start is how I would be feeling if I was having a puppy. Um, so what would you recommend as the most important area of training to focus on for someone who just brought a puppy into their life? Sure. Yes. I thought that's a great question. And like some of the things in training that we see, it really can depend on the puppy yes. and their tendencies. So instead of giving one, I wanted to outline three main areas that I find yes. myself working on with my clients and their puppies for the most part. Lovely. So the first, the first one where we begin often is teaching the puppy how to relax. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, because puppy can get easily overstimulated. And when they do, this can result in uh, biting or jumping or pulling towards things or people or other dogs. And this can sometimes be overwhelming for the humans as well. Um, we also know that puppies are very good from going from zero to a hundred. <laughs> yes, they're, but, they're experts at that. Exactly. <laughs> However, getting them back from hundred closer to zero and being calmer is the art of what we're doing. So yeah. I like to start with that for some puppies. And there I like to play a game that I learned from Dr. Ian Dunbar for the first time. And I've incorporated it ever since in my training. It's called Rile Up and Settle Down. Mm -hmm. So in order to start this game, we do need to teach the puppy um, something basic like a sit stay or a down stay with very short duration, three to five seconds. It doesn't have to be anything too crazy. Okay. And then we begin playing around with the puppy and being kind of silly and goofy and getting them excited. And we're looking for that moment where they are excited, but they're not above the threshold where now they're frenzied. And this is the moment where we stop and we ask for that little sit and a short little stay or a down and little stay and then we reward them for it and then we repeat the game again and again and I love this game because of several reasons the first one is that our puppies begin learning to move themselves in between a state of excitement and arousal and then a state of being able to calm down Yes. It also teaches our puppies to listen to us, even if they're really excited. And the third and last uh, point of why I like this game is that it really allows my clients to kind of get silly and goofy with their dogs and have fun with the training. So training doesn't have to be something stressful. I want it to be fun and my clients can loosen up with this exercise, but it also really gives them that little bit of reinforcement when they can see that their puppy is actually starting to respond and actually stopping the biting and the jumping and being able to do a little sit stay or a down stay. Yeah. I, lo I love that game just to just to add on to that. That is such a classic. And sometimes I'll call it because uh, a lot of people have done this with like young kids too, is that like re uh, red light, green light. So it's like, all right, we're going and then, okay, we're going to stop. So ver very similar, pretty much the same type of game. But I think that that is so cool when you see a client working with their dog 
And you can tell they're happy because their puppy's actually able to calm down for a second or two. And those that have puppies can appreciate a couple of seconds of the puppy relaxing. And it is a skill that you should teach, that you should reinforce, that you should take time to communicate with your puppy that, hey, this is a good idea. It's good to have fun, but let's tone it down now and then get excited again. It kind of helps manipulate in a weird way, not to use the word manipulate, but like it is kind of manipulating their emotional state by saying, get excited and tone it down, which uh, can seem hard, but if you're playing and having a good time, it's actually really easy. So thank you for for explaining that to those listening. Uh, So I know you have a couple uh, other ones so that we have that kind of, what what do you call it again, Tanya? Being able to calm down or relax. What's the the game game called? Yeah, what's the game? and settle down. Rile up, settle down, red light, green light, whatever you want to call it. Make a funny name for your family with the puppy if you want, but I like that one. What else do you got? That's a great one. Yep. I got, for some puppies really need to focus around teaching attention Mm -hmm. uh, on their, to their handler out and about, because for a lot of puppies, when we go outside, they get just completely in awe with the outside world. And they are just, you know, in this state of everything is incredible. (laughs) And a lot of my clients kind of have hard time with that because obviously going outside is experience with two beings on both ends of the leash so we want to make sure that it is a good experience for everyone involved so for those puppies I like to get started with very simple things such as playing the name game so if we're outside we can call our puppy's name and when they look at us we can give them a little treat or we can play play a capturing game where we can go outside and we can stand still for a period of time and wait for our puppy to be like, hey, how come we're not going anywhere and look at (laughs) us and capture that moment and give that puppy a little reward. And I usually, with the capturing game, I call that attention bubbles. I like Mm -hmm. to do at least five repetitions of getting the puppy's eye contact and reinforcing that before moving on. So with these puppies, we're really starting to teach them that, hey, looking at checking in with me really uh, pays off and building value to working with us. Love it. And then as we progress, I like to incorporate, for example, the name game around distractions. So if we are out mm-hmm. and about with our puppy and there is another person with a dog walking by, I want to see if I say my puppy's name, are they going to be able to disengage and look at me? And in order to make it easier, I can say the name and if they're still distracted, I can make a sound or I can even use a little lure and reinforce them for that ability to disengage. And from there, I like to progress to just doing some more basic stuff. So it can be touches or sits or any other skills that the dog is kind of practicing with us, not just Mm -hmm. inside, but outside and around distractions and really building that ability to work with us everywhere. (laughs) I love the name game. That's one of my favorite things. And I think it's, I'm glad that you brought that up because I think it's sometimes overlooked in terms of proactively training that where obviously we love our puppies and we're saying their name a lot, but what happens is the puppy doesn't learn that their name really means anything or that there's anything really in it for them. And of course, sometimes we're saying their name when we're not too thrilled and we're not too happy with them. So to to go off that too, I would recommend for those listening that if you are practicing this, really try your best to not utilize their name in negative context because you're trying to build up and put a lot of money in that jar to help your puppy really love that noise because essentially it's just another noise coming out of your mouth. And so we want that to, to really stick out for them and say, oh, whenever I hear this, I look over at my pet parent and it's great for me. So try to use, you know, I know we're not perfect and sometimes we get 
worried or frustrated with something, we have to say something, say something else, try to use a positive sound to get their attention, but keep their name for the name game, especially for puppies. We really want to put a lot of a lot of coins in that jar, so to speak. And so I, I so those were your three, right, Tanya, we have the the uh, the red, I keep saying red light, green light, because that one's mine, uh, that my name, uh, the name game, excuse me. And then what was the third one? So I, so I kind of put the name game and the attention bubbles in the ah, same okay. category. Love that. Okay. Eye contact and attention and building value with looking at us and checking in. Yes. And I have just one more to Ooh, share. Oh, good. This. Yes. Give it to the people. What's the last sure. one? So the last area is building uh, confidence and creating positive experiences. So this yes. may be relevant to puppies who are um, rescue pups who may not have been exposed to many things in the first few months of their lives or may have had stressful experiences or may have come from a completely different environment. Um, we have a lot of reservation dogs that come into the Denver area and mm -hmm. we have a full on city life going on here here. So for those puppies, what we like to do is create them, uh, create exposures to the environment, but in ways that do not feel overwhelming for the puppy as we create positive associations. So we can go hang out at a park and sit on a bench that is kind of distance away from the main path, but we can still see people, dogs, bicyclists, skateboard, whatever is in the area, and be sure to to reward our puppy when they notice um, each and every one of those people and um, you know other right. things in the environment that just naturally occur. And this way the puppy starts to think, hey, this is not so scary after all because I get good things when I see those. And then just gradually start to bring the puppy closer and closer, allow more interactions while ensuring that the puppy is comfortable so that we can really uh, create a confident dog who can thrive in this new environment that they're being placed in. I love that. I love the basically kind of like a look at that kind of game, mm -hmm. which I, anyone who has heard me talk about leash reactivity will know all about the look at that game. But aside from that, you can play a look at that type of game with just letting your puppy know the sights, the sounds in life on earth is all good for you. They're all great stuff happens afterwards. So it's very Pavlovian, very Pavlov's bell. They see those things, you give them a little treat or you, you start engaging with play or something positive for the dog. And they're going to think, wow, this is, this is the life. All this stuff's really also safe. Like you said, you really want to make sure your puppy feels comfortable. That is very important. So to, to kind of, so obviously I agree with every single one of your recommendations. Uh, so to add to those as some other things that people can think about, Obviously, as, as trainers, we all talk about this, and I'm going to harp on it again for those that may not know already, because you don't know what you don't know. And there was a time where I didn't know, right? I'm sure there was a time you didn't know. We all, we all didn't come pre-programmed understanding all this. So for puppies, socialization is the biggest thing that I focus on with people and tell them about outside of what you mentioned, of course, it's also important, but there's priorities. So mm -hmm. I think the ones you recommended rather than working on some people kind of focus on teaching their puppy to sit or teaching their puppy to, you know, come in from the yard or whatever. And I'm not saying that's not important, but these other things are going to be more long-term in your benefit. I can train a 13 year old dog to, to sit, sit down. Uh, but I can't train a 13 year old dog to accept certain things that a puppy could do at eight weeks old. So that being said, I think socialization is the biggest bucket for people to also consider. And by that, I also want to kind of bring up what the socialization period is, because I think that's something that most don't really know. So the prime time that your puppy has a sponge like brain, not that you can't train your puppy later, but is so roughly before 14 to 16 weeks, which is quite shocking for a lot of people. They're like, what the hell? How am I going to do all this? Now, this doesn't mean you have to expose them to everything on the planet within 14 to 16 weeks, but I would take a look at your lifestyle. 
do you do you like to go out canoeing? Do you plan on bringing your dog out on the water with you? Do you play a sport that they have to get used to seeing your equipment, like your hockey sticks if you play hockey? Or are you in a band and you play the guitar and your puppy is going to have to grow up hearing guitar sounds and your band playing? Or whatever it might be, objects, sounds, things like that. Do you have a big family that has other dogs that are constantly bringing them over into the yard for the family barbecues every few months? And your puppy is going to have to be good with seeing their dogs all the time. You want to prioritize whatever is going to be most likely in your day to day or in your week to week or in your lifestyle in general. So when you're looking at a puppy socialization list, which can be a lot on that list, just circle the ones that you think are going to be most probable in your life with your dog or that you would like to be most probable. So I think that's the biggest thing. And like you said, Tanya, we want to create positive associations with these things. Go at the dog's pace, low and slow, like a slow cooker, and just take it easy with them. But you want to expose positively. And the biggest thing that anyone can do with a puppy is safety. You wanna make sure your puppy feels safe. If your puppy feels safe, they're gonna feel good about it. If they feel unsafe, it doesn't matter what kind of food you're trying to give them or what kind of toy you're trying to distract them with. It, it's probably not gonna work in the way you think it is because fear is going to overpower food or play or other things. So that's also something to keep in mind. You want your puppy to feel safe. Safe, safe, yeah. safe. Um, so I think that's great that you mentioned the, the comfort level. We really want to watch our dogs and make sure that our puppies are feeling good. Uh, the second thing I was going to say, uh, aside from socialization, is, and you kind of alluded to some of this too and mentioned it, but confidence building exercises. I did a, a video with Freddie because that's it was during the pandemic, so I didn't have puppies around me at that time. But I did this with Freddie on a video where I was showing how you could do this at home. So if you have a young puppy, I would highly recommend just taking random stuff out. I had pots and pans and baking sheets and a lot of cooking cookware apparently, but you can bring anything out, a broomstick, whatever you got. Bring a couple items out and just have some treats or a toy your dog really likes, play with them near it, encourage them to walk over some of these things. I even put tin foil down and had Freddie walk over it just to feel something different. Obviously, be careful. This isn't a recipe for every single dog. If your dog's trying to eat the tin foil, let's not do it. But, you know, within reason, find objects and things to encourage them to investigate. If I could get a puppy to want to investigate weird things at a young age, it's really going to help them not be weirded out that all of a sudden there's a piece of luggage in the middle of the room or you moved your couch an inch. We all know a dog that's like, whoa, the chair moved five inches. What the hell's happening? So this will help prevent uh, some of that potentially. And a great way to do that too is just puzzle toys. So enrichment all the way can help puppies be good about exploring, investigating, problem solving, and not shut down right away if they don't know how to do it. So I love starting puppies off with enrichment stuff, which we will get to other toys that we like later in the podcast, but just want to throw that in there. So yeah, so anything to add to that? I'm sure you agree with the socialization stuff too, Tanya. Anything that popped up for you you want to add? Yeah, I, I was just thinking about this, um, the motion of you know, there was, so, there is a lot of information and a lot of uh, ways that we can socialize our dogs, but we're kind of moving away from that idea of, you know, a hundred different people in hundred days. We yes. want to make sure that we have quality over quantity. And mm -hmm. even if we're doing three people for this week, we want to make sure that our three good positive interactions that the dog exactly. has had versus 10 that the dog wasn't sure and were not comfortable, which is um, kind of going to be the opposite of uh, what we want it to be. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, it could be negative. What happens is the dog, you know, don't force your puppy to interact with every single person. I like you, it's a balance, right? We like, we want to expose, but like you said, it's, it's uh, quality, not, not necessarily quantity. Obviously we'd like to do these things more than one time ever, but at the same time, you don't want to overexpose. And yeah. I will say this too, that just reminded me, I say, you know, mere, simply mere exposure 
does not necessarily mean that it was positive. So just mm-hmm. because your dog's seeing a lot of things or hearing a lot of things or exposed to it doesn't necessarily mean that they're like, I love it. They could, it could be just neutral or it could actually be registering as negative if we're not paying attention. So yeah. you don't say any of this to scare y'all, but I just <laughs> say, watch your puppy, make sure they seem happy about it, content, make it positive because that's going to, I'd rather it be in the positive bucket than the neutral bucket because then that could go either way. So, yeah. so yeah, I love that. And I, you know, obviously we could talk about uh, uh, skills in a moment, but I didn't know if there was another, just like, doesn't necessarily have to be training, but just mem- maybe just a general tip or a general understanding or kind of an open-ended question I wanted to, to get from you is just what else people should focus on. It may not be hardcore training or skills related, but what, what can they do to help their puppy as they learn to explore the world or just, you know, the environment around them? Yeah, it's funny because when uh, you started talking about socialization, it was really alluding to the second point that I had prepared, which was kind of, yeah, look at your lifestyle and what your life with your dog is going to look like, ideally, and kind of start to bring that puppy along with you so we can have the exposures. And some of the ideas or examples can be, If uh, your office allows dogs, you can bring your puppy to the office and bring a little chew toy and have them chew on that as you hang out for like a half day or something. If you know that you love going to coffee shop, uh, shops or breweries, you can bring along your puppy and have them experience that environment. And the same goes to hiking or friends and family homes. And the point that I was will come together with this would be to um, really take some time to learn about dog body language. Oh, yes. (laughs) The biggest thing. Thank you. Exactly. Particularly about the signals that dogs uh, display when they're feeling uncomfortable or stressed. And Mm -hmm. some of the more common ones can be uh, lip licking, yawning, um, looking away, or you can see the whites of their eyes, their ears getting pulled back, they can be panting, there can be, their mouth can be really pulled back tightly, tension in the face or the body and the positioning of their tail or overall moving away from something or someone. And if you do notice any of these signals in your puppy, while they're having an interaction or exposure to something or some with someone then you have to interrupt intervene remove your puppy from the situation or Mm -hmm. add on something positive that can help the puppy feel better uh, before moving on with your day because Mm -hmm. you want to make sure that the puppy is comfortable in those new areas and places that we're taking them to and oftentimes we are not equipped to see these more subtle signals unless the dog is already you know snapping or growling a lot of these uh, previous steps where the dog was saying hey I'm uncomfortable were kind of ignored and not seen. So we want to educate ourselves on body language so that we can be the spokesperson for our dog. Yes, I love that. The spokes spokesperson. You have to be your <laughs> dog's advocate. Your dog yes. doesn't know English. Uh, <laughs> you know, we try to teach them some English, but you know, it it's it's definitely important to learn their language or whatever language you're speaking. Not everybody's teaching their dog English, but uh, my, my dogs know a couple Spanish words, by the way, which I love do throwing in there. Um, but yeah, like your, your dog's learning your language as a second language, if you will, they have theirs. So we should give them the courtesy of understanding at least a little bit about how they communicate. And a lot of it is through body language. And I think uh, body language is Probably, I mean, there's other factors, but one of, if not the best way to help prevent bites in the future, 
help prevent dogs that have behavioral issues because you're going to realize when they're uncomfortable right away versus when they're barking, lunging, biting, snapping. That happens later. Uh, they, they, they whisper before they yell, like we say in dog training world. So we have to learn what those whispers are if we can. That's, that's so important. So I'm glad you touched on that, Tanya. I think too, like just a, a basic little one is letting dogs sniff. So I think uh, uh, sometimes there's this misconception on walks or when we go out with our puppy that, yeah, I, I want I want puppies to pay attention to their pet parents. I want them to know their name, to give eye contact. Of course, we need these things for our dogs to live with us safely and, and in a way that we're bonding with them and communicating. But that being said, it turns into almost my dog should do nothing but pay attention to me. And I they have to be looking up at me the whole walk or right next to me. And I'm like, listen, if you really need that for a specific moment, I understand you're crossing a busy street or you're in some busy store or something like sure. But for the most part, let your puppy sniff around. Don't interrupt them. Don't jerk the leash to keep them moving and rush them along. We all know what it's like to feel pressured and rushed. I know I hate it. It gives me anxiety when I feel rushed. So try your best to take a moment, let your puppy sniff around, let them investigate. Again, I love encouraging puppies to investigate things. If you're in a store, you go to a hardware store, you walk around with them and they want to sniff the aisle where the shovels are. Again, as long as they're not going to hurt themselves or climb up on something within reason, let your puppy look around, take it in, take a moment. I think slowing down, letting your dog sniff, stop and smelling the roses, so to speak, is so important. So that's such a big one for me. I got two other ones, but did, so we could go back and forth. Do you have another one for this, for this question? Well, um, that was my main one, but I wanted okay. to add on to what you were saying, which is, um, especially during summertime, you know, pe people get really frustrated because puppies don't want to walk. They just stop. So it's either a puppy that just wants to stop and watch the world go by or, you know, a puppy's tired or the puppy's too hot. So I think that it's important to have the expectation that your puppy is going to need to smell and is going to need to stop and watch the world go by. So yeah, mm -hmm. instead of, you know, pulling on the leash and just going towards where you wanted to go, allowing the, this puppy the opportunity to smell and explore and see what's around them, yeah. to really help continue to build their confidence and just being prepared in our minds that this is going to happen is going to make it a lot easier for us to accept it. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. You know, I think sometimes we have, and I want you to have high expectations for your puppy out there. You know, if someone has puppy, yeah, we want them to be awesome. But at the same time, we have to have also kind of low expectations or no expectations in terms of, you know, goals. Cause I think sometimes we let ourselves down cause we're, we're so up here at a level 10 of what we want and we're starting off at zero. So we have to be understanding that, you know, our puppies are puppies. They're going to be kind of annoying sometimes and stop and stare at things and shut down for a moment cause they smell something or they see somebody. And it's like having a small child at some level, we just have to accept that we decided to have this thing in our lives and it might have uh, some give and take, especially in the beginning when they're trying to just explore the world. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm glad that you touched on that. And I'll, I'll add in just last thing before we go into the skills is um, body handling. Mm -hmm. I'm big, uh, as I'm sure you are, trainers in general, we're very big on preventative measures. So I just deal with so many clients that they're, they had a puppy, they didn't think about this, understandably. You don't know what you don't know, so they don't do it. And then, at, you know, a year, two years, three years or older, their dog cannot stand getting their nails trimmed, can't stand getting brushed, can't stand getting, you know, teeth. We have a lot of grooming to do, teeth cleaning and ear cleaning and getting the goop out of their eyes and checking for, you know, cleaning their butt because they got a dingleberry. These do furry dogs always, everyone has a problem trying to get back there. Uh, you know, their paws, something gets caught there. You got to bend over and try to get it out. And I have dogs that will snap or growl or get really, really nervous and run away from their pet parent. And it's concerning for people. So I think 
prioritizing body handling, again, pairing it with the treat, pairing it with positive reinforcement to say, hey, I'm touching you in all these areas and you get paid. So I touch you and you get paid. It's a lovely, lovely exchange. So they get massaged and then you reward them. And we want to experiment with not just when you're laying on the couch and they're half asleep and you can touch their paws. Like that's great, but it's different than when you ask them to get on the rug and you're hovering over them like you're about to trim their nails. That's a different scenario for them. So you want to mimic these things as best as possible with, with training being the goal, not that you're actually clipping their nails and start slowly getting them used to that process. So body handling is very, very high up on my list for puppy parents. And I wanted to throw that in there. Mm -hmm. And I can add on um, just happy vet visits because oh, the vet yes. can be such a, stress, a stressful place for puppies too and for older yes. dogs. So having a vet that is okay with you coming in and just giving your dog a few treats and kind of leaving or having them just measure their weight and leaving, getting a few treats and pets from um, the front desk. Uh, mm -hmm. people can make a big difference uh, to those dogs so I highly suggest that for puppies Love I'm sure it. most of the vet offices and clinics are okay with you doing that too oh yeah and I I always say uh, from the client's perspective you know call and be like, Hey, this is for you guys too. I want my puppy to be good for you when we come in. So most vet offices are actually going to really appreciate that you're taking that step because I'm sure they deal with a lot of dogs who don't want to be there. So doing happy visits, that's a great add on Tanya. Thank you for bringing that up because again, they're just going to the vet. The only times they're going, they're getting poked and prodded and shots and blood draws and they're getting inspected. And although some dogs can tolerate that, we don't want to mistake tolerance for enjoyment. Mm -hmm. So if we can help them enjoy it a little bit more, absolutely. And for those listening that may have a little bit of an older dog, still bring food with you, a toy, some, a mat your dog likes to lie down on. Try your best to be prepared for these vet visits because better to have all this stuff and not need it than you need it and you don't have it. And then you're just sitting there hoping your dog feels better. So I always bring food and I'm going to, I'm going to kind of say my story. Any single time we've gone to the vet, I have my tree pouch on me with food, different high value food, like chicken, cheese, steak level stuff. I bring a mat with me. I got my calming spray for the dog. Like I really go all above and beyond, even though my dogs are pretty good at the vet, but that's part of why they're good at the vet. <laughs> so making it as, as comfortable as you can is always a plus. So even if you think your dog's trained, doesn't mean you can't still help them out. You know, they're looking to you for extra help. So why not? Mm -hmm. All right. So skills, we can go on and on and have an entire episode on this. So let's pick one to start each first, and then we can add on. But what's like a top skill that you recommend people focus on? We talked about some of the other buckets, but in terms of a behavior or skill, what do you think is, is more of a priority or something people should, should start with? Okay, so here I was uh, kind of, I couldn't decide between <laughs> the name or a positive interrupter. Ah, I like that. Okay. <laughs> because I want us to be able to use the name as a way to get the dog's attention as a first step if they're getting into something and then redirect them away from it mm -hmm. but you were making the point too that we don't want to be already uh, upset and then saying our dog's name in a way that you know we're not happy with them and them uh, freaking out about yeah. it type of thing yeah. so I'm going to add the positive interrupter. A lot of my clients uh, ask me, okay, how can I teach my dog? No, how can I teach them stop? Um, so I always like to kind of shift the conversation to a, a different area. I mean, yeah, we can say no, maybe we can say nope or something that is going to be hard for us to be kind of mean and angry while you're while we're saying it. Yeah, I gravitate towards uh, sounds or kisses sound or a tongue click or some sort of a whistle that let's say if your puppy is chewing on your table leg, you can make the sound they can look at you and then you can redirect them back towards you and substitute that with some other chew that is appropriate. Mm -hmm. So this can be the way to 
to interrupt and redirect, but in a way that is positive, is not going to freak the puppy out and is going to give us the power that we want to feel when it comes to interrupting uh, undesirable behaviors. I'm so glad you brought up positive interrupter. I almost clapped. So <laughs> I think it's so overlooked as, as terms of just, again, pet parents trying to interrupt. We're going to need to plenty of times. And it's, it's even to, even my dogs, there's times I need to get their attention and interrupt something. I think they might be thinking of doing and cut them off, but positive interrupters. So I'm going to commit to this for those listening. Okay. You could do a kissy sound, a whistle. I don't whistle, but little kissies. I do a lot of kissies. I know most dog trainers love the kissy sound. I even do a weird, I'm going to do it. It's like, boop, boop, boop. I sound like uh -huh. Mouse or the Pillsbury Doughboy, but you know, a little like weird, little happy sound that just kind of, you almost want it where your puppy looks back and they're like, oh, what the hell is that sound? Uh, and so something striking, but not in a mean way, because if to your example, Tanya, if your dog is, if your puppy is chewing the coffee table, rather than saying no, ah, ah, hey, yes. you, you know, uh, which I totally understand is where we would like to go because it's upsetting. Try yeah. to train our brains to go Hey, boo -boo, over here, you know, something that's, that gets their attention. Cause I'm, I promise you, I promise you, your puppy's going to come quicker, better, faster immediately versus going blah, 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 because they're going to either run away from you or just be kind of like, Oh, that sounds unpleasant. So <laughs> rather a better way to get your puppy uh, uh, to get their attention, get them over to you. Happy always wins always uh, over sounding negative. I get it. And sometimes I don't sound, you know, I'm a human being. There's times where I sound slightly less Mickey Mousey. It's very minimal because I have trained myself, but I'm human. There's times where I'm like, hey, because I get concerned. I think he's going to hurt himself or something. And then I meet him like, oh, I try to switch it. So I don't scare him either because they're not doing that to piss you off. They're just being puppies. So, um, so yeah, I love that. Positive interrupter is wonderful. It could be whatever sound you like, whatever comes naturally to you is what I would recommend for those listening and, and just train your dog on it. So I make that sound. And then when they look at you, treat them, start that way. So that when you need to use it, when something negative is happening, your dog will give a crap. So that's good. Uh, my biggest, so if I had to pick one for this one, outside of stuff we've already mentioned. I love, 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 love teaching place. And essentially I, when I teach place, it's a settle behavior. Mm -hmm. I don't just teach place in terms of like the puppy will go on the bed. That's good, that's a start. But I like to teach it where it's like, okay, the puppy goes on the bed and lies down and relaxes on it. Then you can really, really do a lot with that. So I would put that towards the top of my list. I have plenty of videos teaching this. I'm sure you have stuff on that. I mean, this is a big one. So um, so there's a lot you could do with this for eating, for if you have small children and you need to help your puppy, uh, the red light, green light game, part of that could be we get excited mm -hmm. and then you go to your bed. So you can yeah. morph it into that too. There's so many uses for it. So they're not uh, jumping all over you when you're making their food, so on and so on and so on. And I tell people this all the time, the biggest cue that I use on a regular basis inside of my home is place. It's the number one thing here. So I use it all the time. So that's my biggest one if I had to pick it. And basically to give a quick thing on this is, um, you know, grab a treat, lure your puppy onto a bed or a mat or a pad or a towel or a rug or something that they can target, reward them, and work your way up to then having them sit on there or lie down on there and then work your way up to intermittently checking in with the treat every few seconds so they really hang on there and that can build into much longer. Again, I have a full tutorial on this, so feel free to check it out, but that's how you would start the process. You want your puppy to think, wow, I get money. I get all the money on this spot. I get all the food over here. So place is a big one for me. I love the positive interrupter though. So I'm, I'm glad that we can put that on here because that's one people don't think of, but they're gonna be using it a lot. Yeah, That's really good. Um, so Tanya, I wanna I wanted to towards the end here give some recommendations because I know you get asked. 
ever wants to know what what should I buy my puppy? We have toys and we have we have treats we're going to go for. So let's hit some toys first. Do you have one or two f- either types or if you have specific ones you want to mention, go ahead. But what kind of toys should people buy? Because there's so much stuff on the market that it can be overwhelming. So what are some essential one or two ones you think people should pick up? Mm-hmm. Well, the, my number one absolute favorite is the flirt pole. <laughs> oh, yes. I, sorry, I just got really excited over the flirt pole. <laughs> Let me reel that back. Yes, the flirt pole. That's a good one. <laughs> Yeah, so for those who haven't seen one, it looks like a big cat toy. It has a long handle, then a long string, and then on the bottom, it can be a rope toy type of toy or a squeaky toy. I always have the flirt pole in my bag when I go to have a consultation with a puppy and uh, pretty, probably 99% of the consultations, I just uh, <laughs> move the third pole around so that the puppy is not biting me all the time and it has something else to engage with. Love that. It's great because there is a lot of space between where you're holding and where the puppy is biting. Um, it really engages with the puppy's instinct to want to chase something, which can be really great. And it can really get a puppy tired when you need to get that puppy energy out. Oh, yeah. So this is really my number one absolute favorite. Love it. And a second one can be uh, interactive and food dispensing toys because puppies need to keep busy and um, if we're not taking them out too much yet (laughs) this means that if they're not engaging with something else they will be engaging with us it it can really (laughs) help buy some time and it can get them tired and if we have them frozen it can help soothe their gums plus studies have shown that dogs prefer to work for their food rather than Mm -hmm. just get it in a bowl so any Kong, uh, a Topo, or any other food dispensing toy that you can stuff with your dog's meal and freeze is my go-to referral for a toy for puppies. I love the Topo. That's one of my favorite. That's probably one of my all-time favorite toys. No offense to the Kong. Kong's the OG, but <laughs> the Topo's coming in for that crown for me because I find it to be just a little slightly better because of the opening. Mm-hmm. So Tanya mentioned the Topple guys and the Topple, you can order these online and find them everywhere. It's by Westpaw. It's probably my number one food stuff, stuffable toy that you stuff food into and you can freeze it. It's hard rubber, but it's more open like a little bowl versus mm-hmm that's kind of a sideways honeycomb looking like a beehive looking bubbly thing which again I have plenty of Kongs and I like them but topple is topping the list (laughs) just a little bit sorry really corny uh that's my dad joke I blame my husband for that so it tops the list for me so topples at the top Kongs up there too for me I love that you mentioned flirt pole because I utilize that all the time with my adult my senior dogs but they're great for puppies is so good for them and tires those suckers out a little bit. So I'm a big fan of that. And it is great for children who want to play with the puppy. You already mentioned this. Your hand is completely detached from where the puppy is going to be biting and chasing. So it's wonderful if you have children or, or uh, even someone in your family that's a little nervous about dogs or nervous about playing with the dog. They're very detached, but they're still engaging with the puppy and it's wonderful. So I highly recommend that too. And I would also add to it is I love snuffle mats. I really think, again, you have to be careful, make sure your puppy's not chewing the fabric and trying to swallow it or something. But, you know, I love them because it's easy to just put their dry food in it rather than the bowl, like you mentioned and it's easy to travel with. You just fold it up and bring it with you to the vet, have them do that when you're waiting in the waiting room, whatever. So I really, I also really love snuffle mats because for puppies who uh, may get nippy at your hands when you're trying to uh, hand feed them for rewards, you know, you're training them on something or puppies that just have like they, this is Freddie. He's not a puppy, but uh, that take the food. And then they're like, ah, like a mile a minute waiting for the next thing. And you almost want them to calm down just a touch. I will mark, like, I'll be like, yes. And then instead of hand feeding, I'll just place it in the snuffle mat, which then buys a few seconds for them to have to make sure they found it. 
just mm-hmm. helps slow that crazy little puppy brain down a bit. I think Fred has a puppy brain still sometimes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I love me a snuffle mat. I love the flirt pole, definitely a big one. And the one I have is like 13 bucks. Like they could be pretty cheap if you don't want to go super fancy to give it a try. Um, mm-hmm. Or if you're crafty, you could even make a snuffle mat and a flirt pole. I'm not crafty. I pay for these things because I suck mm-hmm. at crafting. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's one I would add on to it. I love puzzle toys. I love anything enrichment. So those are some good ones. Uh, And then treats. I mean, people ask about this all the time. So what's like a favorite either type or, you know, uh, if you want to talk about like brands or size or anything you would recommend people think about as like a top pick for puppy treats? Sure. Well, I like to utilize kibble for indoor training. So again, Mm -hmm. since we'll need to reinforce our puppies a lot during their initial stages of being (laughs) in our homes and we teach and reinforce desirable behaviors, Mm -hmm. we can kind of split up kibble and we have one half in a food dispensing toy and another half we can reserve for training and reinforcing throughout the day. And this way we don't have to feel guilty about giving too many because we were going to give them anyway for free in a bowl. Mm -hmm. Um, So take advantage of that. But when it comes to out and about, oftentimes uh, kibble is not going to make it. If you have a lot of distractions, it's a different environment. It's Mm -hmm. important to match the difficulty of the environment with the value of the trees that you have so that your dog is motivated to work with you. So for those times, I will either just bring some boiled chicken. So just boiled chicken breast that I love that because it's very gentle on the puppy's stomach and it can be broken down to very small bits. Mm -hmm. When I'm using commercial treats, I usually gravitate towards a single ingredient freeze dried treats. Yes, Um, me too. Yeah, so Pufford have really great treats or Sojo's or, you know, anything that's uh, kind of in that aisle, single yeah. ingredient freeze dried, and also can be broken down to small, small bits. Yes. I've discovered that I've deli- the, I have the ability to <laughs> break one tree into so many little ones. It's a skill, right? A skill. I can break, yeah, I can break certain tree sounds. Like I, I joke and I'm like, here's a crumb. Uh, yeah, you get really good at that. And you guys can do at home. When you try to do this, you're going to realize I could break these. I could break this, even this small treat in half and get two out of this. Not only is it better for your puppy because you're going to be reinforcing them a lot throughout the day or throughout the training session, but also you're making the life of that bag you just bought double because now you're making one treat into two. So you're doubling that as well. So it's helping your wallet when you're buying all these treats or trying to prepare this stuff. I love that you said just straight chicken, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and if you don't feel like, you know, baking a chicken breast or boiling it or whatever, I'm a big fan of going to the grocery store and getting a rotisserie chicken for, you know, six bucks or whatever it is. And I take the skin off and I just get those like, you know, more healthy bits of it and chop it up. If you want to do that, love that. You know, you don't want anything, anything seasoned or anything like that, but just a plain one, get the plain meat. And I love freeze dried stuff also. I love the brands you mentioned. Um, Some other uh, kinds that I utilize are um, Pure Bites has really good ones that you could break up. And uh, I just bought a bunch from Stella and Chewy's of freeze-dried single ingredient. And my dogs were very interested. One of them was freeze-dried beef hearts. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, let's try. And they, I actually videoed them because they've never seen them so into it. They were, because I've never gotten that specific kind for them. And they were like, wow. And you can tell when your puppy's like, you know, really about something novel. It's something yeah. new, something high value. So like you mentioned, I love using their food inside for basic things and like when they're not distracted. But when you go out to the cafe or the brewery or the store, or you're walking in a heavy traffic area where there's people and other dogs, you do want to pay a higher wage. And I've said this, I think on another podcast, but you want to pay them a wage 
proper to the job that you are asking for. You don't expect somebody to do a job for you for a dollar. You know, they might need a hundred bucks for what you're asking, right? So then they, they might do it then. So I think that's really important to think of in terms of like a wage, a job and a wage that's appropriate. It's easy to keep that in mind. And, you know, I even love for Freddie, not Jade, because Jade is my pickier gal. Freddie will eat a piece of cardboard if I handed it to him, I think, but he's much low maintenance, but not that I'm feeding him cardboard. Don't come at me, but, uh, you know, vegetables. I love using, like, he loves vegetables, like little pieces of carrots, baby mm -hmm. carrots. I cut up stuff like that, you know, yeah. I think that's great. But small pieces, guys, you want the size of like a pencil eraser or the size of a pea. Mm -hmm. really small that way you can you know get more bang for your buck right mm -hmm. I love yeah. that so uh, I wanted to end on this final important question just to help people and I know again this could be a whole topic a whole podcast mm -hmm. topic on its own mm -hmm. but to briefly give like an overview because we're both positive trainers and you know, um, I even hate having to label that, but, you know, we, we use positive methods because there's a lot out there. And, you know, I wanted to touch on why you think as a professional, um, why positive training is so important for pet parents in general, but especially puppy parents, they just got their first puppy or they just got a new puppy when training and communicating with their puppies, why it's important to commit to positive training. So what are your, what are your thoughts on that, Tanya? Sure. I'll start with a quote. Uh, it's actually from Skinner, B.F. Skinner. He said, what is love except another name for the use of positive reinforcement or vice versa? <laughs> oh, my God. I love that. OK, beautiful. So that just summed it up for me. I love it. OK, keep going now. I love that. Yeah. So beautiful to me. Quote. Uh, yeah, using positive uh, reinforcement or positive approach means that we are being proactive into teaching a certain set of skills that we can later use in certain set of situations and environments. And when we repeat the process of asking the skills in those certain environments, we can create a ritual where the environment becomes the cue or the signal for the behavior. And also the environment can be the reward for the behavior. Right. For example, if we ask her dog to sit uh, before they meet someone and they do, and once they've sat, they get some love and pets from the person, this can become a ritual where we started out with one behavior that we thought, but then over time, it's just the setup became the behavior and the reward for it. Right. So really focusing around being teachers to our dogs and tell, and asking them to do a certain set of skills that they already have mm -hmm. versus punishment where a dog is already doing uh, undesirable behavior, something that is natural or something that is learned. Right. And we are waiting for them to fail and then letting them know that they did so. Yeah. And uh, research have shown, in fact, we had a podcast episode with a researcher from Portugal. They had um, this research paper that came out in 2020. It's called uh, Do Training Methods Matter? Um, and there they had three training schools and they found out that positive reinforcement schools were able to achieve better results and also less emotional um, fallout from the training that is being taking place. So that's a really interesting study that you guys can check out, but it can have those fallouts where we may be creating a negative associations with different people or with ourselves. It's uh, ruin may ruin the relationship. It's not something that we do. And a couple of points that I'll just kind of have open ended so that people can kind of think about on their own can be yeah. that compliance can look good but feel wrong That's yes <laughs> preach and it <laughs> and the second <laughs> one is that training without pain is a priority when we're building a trusting and healthy relationship with our dogs yes so. Oh, I'll let you guys think. Oh my God. That. How do I follow this up y'all? All right. So that was beautiful, Tanya. I love the quote and I love those things for people to just to think about, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I don't blame pet parents that are 
you know, looking stuff up online. I mean, we're in the digital era here and everything's available and some of it's not the best, just like anything else. You Google, you have a headache and somehow it's going to tell you that you have minutes to live if you Google too much. And uh, I always say information is only as good as its source because there's information about everything. You can find information that gravity is not real, I'm sure, somewhere. But the, but there's a fact and then there's just like other information. So I, I love that you talked about that. And I think a great way that I like to explain why positive training and positive methods and approaches are optimal and why we focus on them is for, for a couple things. So a, a way to relate can be just like in human interaction. So everything you just said not only applies to the dogs, but it applies to other relationships we have, whether that's your spouse or your best friend or a coworker or your boss or your teacher in school. So, you know, I want everyone to think about what relationships do you appreciate and enjoy the most? Is it a bossy, stern person or a loving, empathetic person who's who's trying to lead you in the right direction, educate you? Have you had a teacher that has tried to help you through your problem areas and, and work with you and direct you in a kind way? Or do you have you had ones that are punishing you and make you feel like you're wrong and an idiot all the time when you get something wrong? And we have a teacher in mind for each of those buckets. At least I do. I think most people have a not so good one and a good one that we remember from our time at school. And, you know, even parenting styles. Do you have a parent or have seen a parent that's yelling a lot and and pointing out a lot of negatives that you suck at this and that and why don't you get up and, and do this? Or one that's tried to talk it out with you and understand where you're coming from a little bit before we move forward together. So I think we can appreciate positive approaches in our day-to-day interactions across the board, whether that's with our animals or with other people in our lives, uh, children and adults alike. So really important. And I also like to say, you can use other methods. And and I think a, a misconception a lot of people out there think is, well, this works. Uh, you know, using this, this tool on my dog or this collar or this approach or dominating over them or whatever, not using a positive method and more aversive method. This works. The dog's doing it, right? My dog's not doing this anymore. And the argument is not whether punishment works. The argument is one, in my opinion, it's not needed to get Mm -hmm. a result. And two, it comes at potentially a big cost of trust and relationship and your bond with your animal and all of that. So um, can it work? Sure. Do you need it to get there? Absolutely not. So I'm always thinking if I can get there in a positive way, why would I do anything else if this works? So it's effective and it comes with no negative side effects when you're using positive methods. So I think that in and of itself, I don't think anyone gets a dog because they feel like having this battle with them when they get home. Um, I know it can feel like that sometimes with some of our puppies, but if you commit to positive methods, I promise you, you will be able to reach these goals if you're doing everything properly and you can hire a positive trainer to help you. It's all in the mechanics and the approach, but using positive reinforcement is never going to leave you with really negative side effects. And I think that's a big takeaway that people can keep in mind is you get the results without the side effects that can come with other types of training that are not positive. So I like positivity and I'm very food motivated as a human being. So I I like, and, and I like play and adventure just like other dogs. I think of myself like a dog sometimes, but uh, maybe in another life, I, I, I was one, but, uh, but yeah, we all want to be positive with our dogs. So I promise you, if you, if you commit to that, it's going to be a much more enjoyable experience for both you and your dog. So love that. I love that. Can you say the quote one more time before we sign off? I want the quote, uh, the BF Skinner quote one more time. Sure. What is love except another name for the use of positive reinforcement or vice versa? Yes. And I just wanted to say that I wanted you to say that again, because I absolutely adore that. So I'm glad we got to touch on all these puppy topics. And I hope this was helpful for those listening. Tanya, you are awesome. I want everyone to know what you're up to and where they can connect with you. 
Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. It was so fun talking about puppies. I love puppies and I love working with them. So Me that too. was lots of fun. So yes. people can find us uh, at our website at familypupspupz.com. We have our own podcast, which is the Family Pups podcast. We have it as a page in our website. We have a blog page where we like to share a lot of information. Um, we are on social media at Family Pups, on Instagram mainly. And guys, that's with a Z. So family pups, P-U-P-Z. Just wanted to exactly. reiterate that. So if you're trying to find them. Yeah. And I'm actually currently teaching a series of a puppy training overview and Q&A session for a local puppy rescue. All of the, awesome. it's a donation based class and all the donations go back to the rescue. So if you have a new puppy, you can join a, a class. It kind of provides an overview of everything you need to know as a new puppy parent. And we have some time for Q&A at the end. It's been a fun class. I've been teaching teaching this for two years, ever since the pandemic started. So it's been oh, lots of that's so awesome. So if anyone is interested, that's available yes. too. That's I so cool. Do you have a link? Do you have a link to that class on your uh, website, Tanya, or on your yes. social? Okay, good. So they'll be able to find that through your link, link in the bottom yeah. type thing. Okay, cool. So yeah, we have an events page on our website and they will find it it's in the there. event section. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I didn't know you were doing that. That's so cool. Thanks for sharing. Because that, you know, that benefits the rescue. It benefits uh, those that need help with their puppies and um, and you're there to help everybody. So that's, that's stinking awesome. Um, all right, cool. Well, I'm glad. Thank you, Tanya. Everybody, you know, where to connect with Tanya. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you again for coming on today. I'm so glad we got to touch on these important topics to help people that I know a lot of people got puppies over the last two years, never mind over the holidays and the last few months. So hopefully this will help you and you found it valuable. Tanya, thanks so much again for coming on. I really appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And for those listening, as always, treat yourself and treat your dogs.